Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on setting your tuition fees delivered by the ISM Trust. I'm John Robinson, Head of Service Delivery and System here at the ISM and thanks for joining us. Just before we begin, a few technical points. You can't see me, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. You should also be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. So if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and I'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org slash webinars. So that's the technical stuff out of the way. In this session, I'm going to be telling you about the results of our recent survey of fees for music teaching. I'll also be giving you some tips on how to use the survey when setting your own fees. For those of you who maybe don't know us, the Incorporated Society of Musicians, or the ISM, was established in 1882 to promote the art of music and to support professional musicians. Now, 135 years later, we support a membership of almost 8,000 music professionals of all kinds, teachers, performers, composers, and many more besides, with legal advice and representation, tax and business advice, and award-winning professional development opportunities along with the campaigning and advocacy for the music sector as a whole. Through our sister charity, the ISM Trust, we've established a means to share our experience and expertise with musicians beyond just those who are ISM members. And this webinar is part of the Trust's professional development opportunities open to all musicians. We're in a dialogue with musicians. We find out what matters to you and we act on it. What you tell us helps shape our campaign, services and development activities for members and for the music sector. This session is part of that dialogue. I hope you'll find the information helpful. It will be available on our website at ism.org shortly after this webinar. There are two parts to this presentation. First of all, the summary of our survey findings. And the second part, some tips on how you can use the findings when setting and negotiating your own fees. This presentation will take about 30 minutes and there'll be time for your questions at the end. Just a comment about our survey. It's the largest of its kind in the UK and we've been commissioning these surveys for many years now and achieve a consistently high response rate. We work with the professionals at the University of Reading for these surveys. The present survey was undertaken in autumn 2016 and ask individuals for information about teaching fees as at September 2016 and accompanist fees between January and September of 2016. Nearly 1,100 music teachers responded. Respondents would have included ISM members and non-members and statistically this response rate matters. The high response rate gives credibility to the survey and is an authoritative indicator of the fees actually charged by the professionals. Undertaking surveys of fees that members and other professionals charge in a variety of settings is, is important when helping you understand your value as professionals, particularly where you're freelancers and there's no set rate for your work. We cannot set rates for freelancers. This is against competition law rules, and we could be accused of price fixing by the competition authorities. But we can show you what the landscape looks like so you can make informed decisions about the rates you charge. Nevertheless, we can express a view as far as employed music teachers are concerned, and we will come to this shortly later in the presentation. The survey findings fall into four sections, which we take in turn. First, private music teachers. Secondly, self-employed visiting music teachers. Thirdly, accompanists for examinations and finally employed visiting music teachers. Our first section, this is all about private music teachers. Our survey found that overall, a significant majority of teachers charge between 27 and 38 pounds per hour. And I should just say a word on the terminology used throughout the survey findings. By majority, we mean that 20% of respondents paid more than the top end of the range and 20% below the lower end. By midpoint, we mean that 50% charge the £30 shown here uh, or, or more and 50% charge this or less. 
the geographic differences between the fees that you see in the slide mirror previous findings and come as no great surprise, therefore. We do get asked sometimes why the results do not split out into more regional analysis. And the answer from the statistici statisticians that we commissioned to analyze the results is that beyond those shown, there is insufficient variation in non-specified regions from the rest of UK category to warrant separate figures. That is to say, if your region is not named, you can assume the rates disclosed in the survey will map across to the rest of UK figure. One slight change this year, the southeast of England and East Anglia have begun to deviate from the rest of UK figure. So the statisticians felt there was justification in highlighting these regions this year. In terms of increases in rates, 30% of you told us that you'd increased your rates in the last 12 months at an average of two pounds per hour. Nearly half of those respondents expected to increase rates again sometime between September 2016 and September 2017. For self-employed visiting music teachers, almost 43 of respondent teachers were working in independent schools, almost 40% in state funded schools, 9.1% in music services and just under 3% in specialist music schools. This is broadly in line with previous results. What we do see is the differences between the fees paid in independent schools, state funded schools and music services in hubs. The ranges are quite broad within these segments. There's also the geographical effect too. Looking at the midpoints, London leads the pack but with the South East and East Anglia only just behind and in maintained schools actually being one pound ahead. But there are some consistencies within these findings too. There's considerable consistency across the UK in maintained schools, not a huge difference in ranges and very little in the midpoints. London and the rest of the UK are at £30 an hour, the South East and East Anglia at 31 Hubs and music services likewise, as far as the midpoints are concerned. The greatest variation is in the independent, in, independent sector and reflected geographically. Again, as far as increases are concerned to rates, 61% of you told us that you'd not had an increase since September 2015. Less than half of our respondents in this sector said they expected an increase in the 12 months from the September 2016 survey. Turning to accompanists, the results for accompanists reflect our expectations. The higher the exam grade, the more teachers are charged. It is worth noting perhaps that while we've had fairly high response rates for the main exam grades, this fell away for the questions about festivals, amateur organisations, school choirs, dance lessons and auditions. There is quite a lot of variation here across the ranges, and while no geographical data was produced for these, one might infer reasonably that the rates paid will reflect the tendencies we've seen previously uh, as to geography. In terms of increases, the rates appear to be steady rather than increasing. Our fourth and final sector within the survey, employed visiting music teachers. We note that rates for employed visiting music teachers have not generally kept up with indices for the cost of living, average wages, and so on. Now, this may reflect wider issues within the economy and government policy in relation to state education and local authorities. So we would suggest the following as a guide. For independents and specialist schools, we would suggest 36 to 40 pounds per hour for London, 30 pounds 50 to 35 pounds elsewhere in the UK. For all other schools, services and hubs, we would suggest 29 pounds to 34 pounds per hour in London and 26 to 30 pounds elsewhere. Now, there are a couple of observations to make here in, in respect of rates for employed visiting music teachers. Do remember that employed visiting music teacher rates, which on the face of it are lower when expressed as an hourly rate compared with other teaching rates, will carry other costs to the employer, such as 
Employers national insurance, which is 13.8% over a current threshold. The employer contribution to your pension, if you're in one. Statutory holiday pay, according to the ACAS formula, 12.07% of your pay uh, needs to go into holiday pay. Do also remember that as an employee, you'll have deductions made for income tax on a PAYE basis. Your employee national insurance contributions and any other employee contributions or agreed deductions. So this concludes our review of the results of this survey. You'll find the summary of the results on our website and we will give you the uh, web address at the end of this presentation. So on to part two of this presentation, how can you use these results when setting your fees? And here are a few things to think about just to start with. Locality, your general region can be a starting point, as we've seen there are geographical variations, but also your specific location within your region. For example, I live in, South, in London, Southeast 5 is my postcode. This has a very different economic profile to London Southwest 5, which is Earl's Court, not too far from the ISM's offices. Although both are in London, there will be marked differences between what I could charge as a teacher compared with my teacher friend who lives in Earl's Court. This sort of differentiation can also apply at the school level. If you're teaching in a school, what's the status of that school and how does that line up with local conditions? What else is going on? How is the economy affecting your clients? There's lots to think about with Brexit. We don't know yet how this will affect the UK economy overall once we leave the European Union. Do bear in mind inflation. It's still uh, present but predicted to rise. Think about interest rates if you have a mortgage. They're low at the moment but likewise predicted to rise. So a word about your own overheads of teaching privately. How might these change? Will you need to factor increases in costs into your fees? And how will you do that? We would suggest that you think about your market value and having an understanding of your market value is really important. The points here are straightforward commercial points and we would just suggest that you use your knowledge and judgment to make decisions about what you charge and indeed be aware of what others are charging around you. You want to make sure that your work will be properly valued and that you will not be affecting others by undercharging. This devalues the professional status of teachers as a whole, so do have an eye to external issues. Again, our surveys can signpost you to going rates to inform your understanding of your market value and what you could be charging. Where do you fit in? This slide follows from the previous slide to the extent that it's all about understanding your circumstances and using your judgment to make decisions. These points are really uh, are about you and your own background and experience as a professional teacher and where you are now, both geographically, but also in terms of your career. We've touched on locality and external factors. So the next things to ask include, how long have you been teaching? What are your qualifications? How specialized are you? All these factors can play a part in setting your rate. Some other questions you might want to think about where are you in your life? Do you need lots of pupils? Could you afford to have fewer? What's the wider picture of your life? And how does earning a living from teaching fit into it? You may want fewer pupils. You may be able to charge more for those that you do have. You, you may want to attract new pupils if you're starting out. So price could be a factor in gaining new pupils. These are just some examples, and I'm sure you'll be able to think of other rele relevant examples in your own cases. Negotiating fees with your students or the parents of your pupils can bring challenges because of the personal relationships involved in this context. So talking about fees and increases needs handling with some care. Here are some suggestions for you to think about. 
Think about how to keep things on a business-like footing, starting with a signed teaching contract, which sets out, among other items, the initial teaching rate and provisions for future increases in fees. ISM members can download a pro forma private tuition contract, which can be easily adapted for school teaching work where your contract is with your pupils' parents. Make sure you give plenty of notice if you intend increasing your rate. Again, ISM members can download a pro forma written notice of fee increases. Ideally, give months, not weeks. Explain that you may charge more than some other teachers in your area because you're more qualified or experienced than they are. Uh, they may not be ISM members or listed in the ISM music directory. Use our survey results as a tool. They're an indicator of what qualified professional music teachers such as yourself have been charging recently. Remember also that you don't have to increase your rates every year and our survey suggests that most teachers raise their fees only once or twice, uh, only once every two or three years. Be prepared if necessary to point out that music teaching is your business and your livelihood depends on it. School rates can bring a different set of challenges. In practice, many schools specify a uniform rate to be charged by all their visiting music teachers. You will probably not want to charge more or less than other music teachers in the school for fear of losing pupils to them or of being seen as undercutting them. But none of this should stop you from being proactive in seeking a higher fee if you feel that the school is, is paying a below par fee. Review your rates annually, taking into account our survey results to check you're not falling behind the pack. If you think your school rates are too low, don't be afraid to raise this with the school authorities. You could do this as a group representing the visiting music teachers as a whole. Alternatively, your head of music might be prepared to negotiate a fairer rate for you on your behalf. ISM members can also talk to our legal team to see how we could help you in these situations. Always have a contract. When the ISM goes to talk to students about legal essentials for musicians, we always stress the importance of contracts and in particular the importance of getting things in writing. It can save so much unhappiness later if the terms for a job or a piece of work are set out clearly and unambiguously in a written document from the outset. So this is true for teachers as well. As we mentioned earlier, get a contract in writing. We have templates for private teachers which ISM members could download. We also recommend getting written details from schools if you're working in the school but self-employed. For example, is there an agreed commitment that you will be given a room for teaching? If so, get it in writing. Are there any other obligations that the school may have towards you or you towards the school? Get these things in writing and make sure that what you receive reflects what you've agreed. If you're employed, your employer is obliged to give you a statement of particulars which will set out the key points of your engagement and this will usually form part of the contract of employment. If you're in any doubt as, the, as to the terms and conditions of your employment, get in touch with our legal team if you're an, an ISM member. This concludes our review of our survey and our tips for setting fees. We hope this has been helpful. And as mentioned earlier, you can find a summary of the, res of the results on our website, separated out into the four categories that we reviewed earlier. We'd also like to commend our teachers pack to you, which is published by the ISM Trust. This is full of valuable information for all teachers and also includes some of these thoughts on setting fees. You can download it from our website and we'll give you uh, the address in the next slide um, for links to the pack and everything connected with this webinar. I would just like to thank you all for listening um, and you'll see the address here for the survey results on our website 
and we are now open for your questions. Thank you very much. Just a reminder that if you do have any questions, um, please type them in the questions box that should be showing on your screen. Okay, we'll be happy to wait for a few moments while you're formulating any thoughts that you, you may have. Do take your time but we're keen to hear from you if you have anything that you'd like to know. It could be that I've managed to answer all of your questions in the course of the, uh, the webinar. Um, I would be surprised if that's the case. So please don't be shy. If you have a question, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question. Oh, they're coming through now. Very good, thank you everybody. Okay, do we have any advice about a room rental rate? Um, not really, we do ask about rental rates um, and much of what we find um, is that nominal fees are made, um, a pound a term or whatever, um, or nothing in some cases. However, we are aware that there are um, instances of people being charged quite a lot. Um, I think I would suggest that if you have if you're unhappy about what's going on, get in touch with our legal team if you're an ISM member, because I think we would like to find out about this. It's all part of understanding what it looks like, what the going rate may be, and of course, if there's any trends, if there's any changes. As I say, our impression is very much uh, that nominal fees only are charged, but with pressures on schools to monetize their assets, their spaces, that may change. So I think we need to hear about it if it's happening to you. I hope that helps. Um, we can't give a more specific answer than that, but we would ask you to check in with us and let us know if things are, are changing. Okay, I have a question here about should you include your fee on the internet or wait until the student is interested? I think this is a really interesting question and this comes down to how you market yourself as a, a business in a way. Um, I think that there are pros and cons of both. I think if you're looking to attract students, um, and that's you're starting out, for example, it goes back to that point. You might want to advertise what you're charging straight away so that uh, if you have people who are seriously interested, you will get their interest in your rates straight off. So think about marketing, think about where you are. Um, there's no harm in doing it. Um, absolutely. Depends on what you're wanting to, to get. Okay, here's another good question. Is it advisable to ask for tuition fees in advance of a series of lessons or after the lessons have been given? Now, if this is a question about when should you get paid, um, our view really is that you should be paid in advance. Um, rather than after the lessons have been given, because if you don't receive the payment, um, you have a little option but to try and recover a, a debt if you don't get the fees. You have no leverage over the person involved in terms of you know, stopping lessons if, you, if it gets to that. So we would always ask for, suggest that you ask for the, the payment in advance. Um, have a look in our teacher's pack. Um, it will cover some of these points as well. I recommend that you download a copy of that too. 
All right. Now, here's a very interesting question. In terms of employing another teacher to work for my small business under my name, how would you recommend charging the pupils in this instance? How much would come to me and how much would go to them? Now, this is something that we've, I'm not sure that we're able really to advise you on um, because the survey results and, and where we approach things from is about the person, if you like, at the kind of end of a chain. End of a chain. You are the teacher in whatever environment and this is sort of what you're going to get paid. If you've got a, a, a business which involves your hiring other musicians, um, I think you may need to ask around others who do things in a similar way. We don't have that information, I'm afraid, although it is something that we're interested in. Um, so I don't think I can answer that question directly, I'm very sorry to say. Right, now this is an interesting one. When applying for my school position, it was advertised at £26 per hour. Once contracted, this then became £23 per hour with a complicated explanation of where the other £3 had gone. Is this usual? I've raised the issue with the finance department and not had a response. Well, I thought one of the things to think about here is let's go back to legal basics. A contract um, is among, at its, at its basic, an offer which is accepted in exchange for consideration. So in this case, you were offered £26, you accepted £26, and that's the consideration for the job. So if it became 23 once it had been contracted, technically speaking, the original offer had been withdrawn. So had you, if you've just gone with it, then potentially you might have reaffirmed the change. I would say it's unusual. Um, if you're an ISM member, um, I would suggest that you get in touch with our legal department. We might be able to see if there's anything that we can do. If you have been working on the £23 per hour, it may be difficult to do anything because it may be that legally you would be considered to accept at that rate and there's not much that we can do about it. But if you're an ISM member, do get in touch with us. Any advice on cancellation fees? Um, if, if a student cancels with notice. Um, I suppose I have a question here. Cancellation fees in the sense of um, terminating the agreement to provide tuition. Um, our standard contracts provide for uh, a, a degree of notice. Um, I think half a term is the sort of going rate at the moment. Um, we have to be a little bit careful. Everybody has to be... Oh, right, there's cancelling a lesson as well. Okay. Um, I think the cancelling a lesson, the teacher can exercise some discretion um, if you want to... If, it, if it's reasonable for you to do it. You can say, all right, well, we can re rearrange it if it's convenient to you and you don't penalise the... Um, the other party. If they've cancelled it with no notice and you haven't had any opportunity to do anything else or book another lesson or, or, or make use of the time, um, then depending on what your contract with your pupil says, um, then it becomes much more reasonable to think about charging for the missed lesson. Again, have a look at what contracts you use. Our contracts will, our standard contracts for members will spell these things out. Um, it really depends on what you've got, but have a think about what's reasonable, when it was cancelled, how much notice, what could you do with the time. I hope that helps. How many lessons should you ask to be paid for in advance? I think there's various ways of, of, of looking at this. For private teachers, we have three flavours of private teacher contract. Um, we have one where it's done in it's linked to the school term, so it's however many lessons there are on that term. Others, we look at a series of 10 lessons, for example, and we also have a, a kind of pay-as-you-go uh, arrangement for people that may just want to have the occasional lesson, and we have terms and conditions that deal with it, uh, as far as that's concerned. I think if you're worried about things like um, your cash flow, uh, you want to ask uh, to be paid up front, excuse me, for as many as is reasonable. Um, so if you're going to be 
offering it on a termly basis on a session of 10, for example, ask for all that in advance. Um, it's up to you, really, um, but think about what would, be, what would be the impact if you weren't paid, if you had 20 um, contracts and you didn't take anything in, in advance. How would that leave you in terms of your own outgoings, your own commitments? So again, think about where you are. Think about your own, um, you're working as a professional, what it would mean if you didn't get payment in advance. Could you actually afford it? Would you be running up debts elsewhere? How will you enforce the payment? Um, caution is always uh, a good thing in these uh, circumstances. So I would suggest um, that you ask for as much in advance as possible. All right, thank you all of you for those very interesting questions. I hope I've answered um, them for you. Um, if there's any more, please let us know. Alternatively, if there are no further questions, um, and we'll give you just a minute. Just while we're waiting for that minute to come up again, uh, do follow the link on your screens to our website. You'll find so much of this stuff here. The Teachers Pack, to which there's a link on the page mentioned, will cover quite a lot of this ground as well, so uh, I, I would commend that to you, as I mentioned earlier. All right, I don't think there are any more questions, so I'm just going to round up by saying thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Thank you to those who um, sent in their questions. Very glad to hear from you. Um, many thanks once again, and goodbye for now. <laughs>